Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live. It is Friday. Oh, gosh, what is it? March, April? I think April the 1st, actually. Uh, so anyway, uh, this broadcast is definitely going to be one that is going to challenge you in prophetic terms like no other video I've ever done. Uh, I'm hoping for many of you, it'll wake you up. It'll open your eyes. I'm hoping that it'll really bless your heart, the real truth. Because the truth, as we know, Jesus said, will set you free. And after these uh, two parts that I've done with Yana thus far, actually, I should say Yana has done this. I'm just there for support and encouragement, and I'm very happy to see her uh, back again uh, fighting that good fight. And... I really wanted to take and share with you, my friends, here, uh, right here, biblically, uh, that will back up the things that she's saying. Because there are many people that are looking at biblical prophecy and they're saying, well, wait a minute, we got Ezekiel 38, Russia's there coming in there to wipe out Israel. They're, they're, feeling, they're going to fulfill prophecy. And friends, there, there's so much prophecy that is being fulfilled or has been fulfilled or uh, has been totally misunderstood. So I'm asking you really to prayerfully consider the information you're going to hear today. It's going to be shocking. And, uh, and two, if God lays it upon your heart to support this broadcast that we're doing, then please prayerfully consider that. Uh, IsraeliNewsLive.org is our website, as you can see here on the beginning of the screen. Uh, you can donate online or via mail, either way, and we certainly appreciate your help as we go along. Let's get right into this, though. Um, I wanted to start off with a couple of articles here. This is from the Times of Israel, uh, and, and it has to do with the fact that not only Palestinians, but especially Bedouins are actually descendant of Jewish people. Uh, in fact, I might even argue, especially in the case of the Bedouins, they're more Jewish than the leaders of Israel that are in the country even now. This is from the Times of Israel, written by uh, Dove Ivory. Most Palestinians are Jewish, or, excuse me, Palestinians are descendants of Jews. In 1956, the Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion sent Moshe Dayan with a rabbi to start giving lessons in Judea, uh, Judaism to Bedouins in the Negev. Well, was Ben-Gurion suddenly struck with a missionary zeal? He was just acting on knowledge that he and Yitzhak ben Zivi, the president, has talked about for years. Most of what we now call Palestinian Arabs are descendants of Jews. Among the Bedouin, that could reach 100%. I don't know if you've ever been to Israel, but if you have, I lived in Israel, lived there a couple of times already in my life. And uh, the Bedouins are some of the most hospitable, kindest people you would ever meet in your life. Um, they still live the way that we would read about Abraham, wandering about in their tents, uh, still living in tents, in the deserts. And... So totally different altogether. But the article goes on to say, Sivia Masani, a software pioneer who has devoted his life to assembling the facts on this issue, says that 90% of Palestinian Arabs are descendants of Jews and 50% know it. This would explain some curious phenomena. When the Jordanians took over Judea and Samaria in 1948, they found no mosque there, and King Hussein was the first one to build one. The Crusaders, when they came here, found that the Arabs here spoke Aramaic, not Arabic. And both facts would explain if most of the Arabs in this land were really former, or in this land were really former or crypto Jews. I find that interesting. But let's take another one. Now, for Arut Shiva to make this claim on their website is pretty bold and brash. Israel National News or Arut Shiva which means the land of seven. Bedouin, our fathers were Jews. 
An Israeli Bedouin sheikh tells uh, INN TV that he is of Jewish descent. Historians claim most Bedouin Arabs in Israel are Jewish. Imagine that. If you ever notice the most discriminated people by Ashkenazi Jews from Europe are, of course, the Palestinians, the Bedouins, and even their own, the what we call Sephardic Jews, which are not always Sephardic, they could be they're more Arabic Jews that are that are Jews that come from the Middle East to begin with, whether it be Northern Africa, whether it be um, uh, from down in Iran or over in Iran, uh, Iraq, uh, different the Yemenite Jews, all of these very much are looked down upon as low life. Uh, my own father, well, I won't go into that issue there. We'll kind of leave that out. But I would just say that that's the side that I'm from, the side that is not very much favored. We'll just say like that. A good, good example here on uh, IMEMC News, Israel demolishes Bedouin village to build a Jewish-only town. Oh, nice of them. And yet knowing that they are Jewish. In that same article right there, despite protests, the Israeli government will displace the Bedouin population of Umm al-Haran to a temporary area until a new neighborhood is built for them nearby. However, residents won't be welcome to return to the new Jewish-only city in, uh, of Hiran. That's why the bulldozers have all these cages and stuff on them. Because everything they do is illegal. Completely wrong. It's the Real News Network. I'm Shima, uh, Shimani Perez coming to you from Baltimore. The government of Israel recently announced that the evacuated population of Bedouin town of Umm al Hiran will be displaced to a temporary area. They will be forced to remain there for some 15 years while a new living area is found for them. 15 years. they got to go live somewhere else so the Ashkenazis could you know, build their own little place, right? Shvi Yisrael, uh, which is means return to Israel. Uh, this is uh, Michael Frund, his website. Actually, we have the same name, same website. His is .org, mine's .com. I just don't use it much anymore. Israel, uh, excuse me, return uh, Israel. It was a, it was back when I was more pro-Zionist at the time. But Svi Misani, here again, he writes here, among those who have researched the topic is Svi Misani, an Israeli businessman who writes and speaks extensively about the connection between the Palestinians and Jews. He claims that nearly 90% of all Palestinians are descended from the Jews who remain in Israel after the destruction of the Second Temple 2,000 years ago, but were forced to convert to Islam. And that didn't actually happen until the Ottoman Empire took over, but that's true as well. Uh, and by the way, not all of them were... Uh, still Jewish either. Many of them uh, were believers of Jesus. Uh, and that's one reason why we had more Christian uh, beliefs and churches inside of Israel when, the, uh, when Israel uh, became occupied to be a nation in 1948, of course, even earlier in the 1930s. Uh, according to Miss uh, Sinai, the Hebrew ancestors of the Palestinians were rural mountain dwellers who were allowed to remain in the land in order to supply Rome with grain and olive oil. That's very true. Uh, Misani is an advocate of this theory. He's not, all, he's not the only scholar or even political figure to claim a Jewish connection for the Palestinians. The first president of Israel, Yitzhak ben Zvi, as well as former Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion wrote several... All right, so here we go. I was able to get the other two put in there so we can continue on. Hopefully I won't have to keep doing this. Uh, Revelation 13, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw the bees rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And by the way, I know many of you are probably saying, Steve, you just went into this recently. Yes, I did. But we're going into a lot of other scriptures, so bear with me. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him power and his seat in great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. Well, that deadly wound was when Jesus Christ identified, according to Matthew 23, 
And that slide will come up later in here, so I'm not going to worry about trying to run down and find it for you right now. But Matthew 23, Jesus identified the Pharisees as the serpent. He said, you are of your father the devil, and his works you'll do. Remember that? And he said to them, you vipers, you serpents, generation of vipers. He was quoting from the fact that he knew that they had mingled their seed according to Ezra chapter 9. And we have already done that many, many times in other videos. But one of the heads were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? You know, this is what's so dangerous. You don't realize when you are worshiping Israel and you're lifting up a modern state of Israel that is not even the true Jewish people to begin with. And they're serving, basically, I mean, they'll tell you they're serving the devil. Do I have the book here? No, I don't. They believe that the serpent of the Garden of Eden, according to Rabbi Leitman, was their helper. According to Rabbi Tzedak, who wrote that book, Angels, uh, let's see, Demons and Angels and something like that. I, I've shared that with you before. Uh, he said, if you see a golden reptilian hand, don't be afraid. That's our gods. Yeah. Yes. No wonder why we have these issues going on. Why you see the dragon gives them their power. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death because Christ gave that wound as the prophesied of Genesis. And his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. See, the people have forgotten. You forgot what Jesus said. You know, in fact, let me, let me just, let me, let me, I, I got to go down to where Jesus said that because you got to really have that. I'm not sure exactly where it's at. Here it is right here, Matthew 23. Fill you up the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? See, I'm not making this up. It's facts, friends. It's just facts. It's cold, hard facts. All right? That's where we're at. Now, and I wished I had the books with me here to show that to you. Um... Boy, you know, that's another one. Let me, let me just, let's, let's look and see real quick. Let, let's jump over here. We'll jump out of the power slide presentation. Let me go over here. Rabbi uh, Sadok wrote several books and articles on the subject. Okay, so it's true, right? That makes you wonder then when you think of Revelation chapter 2, right? When we're reading, and not just Revelation chapter 2, you also have Revelation chapter 3, on um, when we're dealing with the churches of of uh, which we could say were of, of that time back then. But also, you could apply it even to this day. I believe all seven churches are a reflection all the way down through the ages. But notice right here, verse 9. I know there are works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Well, the one reason why Smyrna was having that problem back then is because, as Jesus said about the Pharisees, you're a bunch of serpents and vipers. Fear none of those things which, which you will suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. But be you faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. It doesn't show that they're going to have any mercy. You know, and that's Smyrna. Could Smyrna represent Palestinians of today, knowing that they're going to have to die at the hand of this elite, so-called claiming to be Jews that are as a synagogue of Satan? Don't know. Something to think about. Now we're going to really get into the very interesting aspects of biblical prophecy. And I hope I've got this PowerPoint laid out properly. It's in depth, it's a lot of information, but I trust it'll be a blessing for you. We're going to start off in Isaiah chapter 27. And that day the Lord with his sword and great strong sword will punish Leviathan, the slant serpent, 
and Leviathan, the torturous serpent. He will slay the dragon that is in the sea. Now, verse 1 has its roots in Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to go there in just a moment. And of course, it uses the word nachash in yellow. You see highlighted al veyatan veyatan nachash bauach bariach. Excuse me. This is where we're going to find out. Is we read on veal veyatan nachash akalaton, where God is going to punish Leviathan, the slant serpent. Nachash, a serpent, with a sword. And this is when I wish I had put in the scripture for that as well, that the word of God is more powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, right? Remember that in the New Testament? We also know that Jesus, that, you know, from his mouth went forth that sharp two-edged sword. What he spoke because he was the word of God. And we know according to Genesis chapter 3. Let's see here. Nope. I uh, don't have. Ooh. I uh, don't have. There we go. Right there. We have right here. Verse 15. Now, if you notice. I had to make some corrections here. They did not translate this to English correctly. In memory. Mechon's um, Hebrew Bible. But he says. I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your seat and her seat. Now, literally, in the Hebrew on the left side, where it's highlighted in black, it says who. That means he. All right? He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise their heel. That's what the scripture says. That is the wounding. That is the prophecy of Christ coming. The enmity, of course, is hatred between the woman and, and her children, and, of course, between that and the devil's children. So Satan definitely has hates the true seed, which is Christ's seed, and Christ will come and actually wound the head. And that's another scripture I just remembered. I wish I'd have put in this PowerPoint and forgot to put in there. Uh, and that'll be where, where the scripture speaks about um, uh, they received the deadly wound and he did live. Uh, mm, boy, there's so much I still need to put in this thing. Wow. All right. Let me go back up. I may have to pause this video here in a minute just to get some of these things in there. But let me let me continue on before I do that. I, I think I will pause it and I'll, we'll come right back to this. As you go down, it says, He will slay the dragon that is in the sea. Now you're dealing with the word Tanin. Tanin, right there in the green highlighted to your left, Hatanin is a dragon. That is the word synonymous for dragon. It also applies to Leviathan. It is the word that is used when Moses' rod is turned into a serpent, etc. All of that is the case. Um, in fact, that's why we have Exodus right here. And Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Literally, latanin, litanin. It became veyahi uh, letanin. A serpent or a dragon. All right. So the word tanin is also synonymous with just like the word nachash. All right. But you go on down. In that day, sing you of her vineyard of foaming wine. I, the Lord, do guard it. I water it every moment, lest mine anger visit it. I guard it night and day. Fury is not in me. Would that I were as the briars and thorns in flame. I would with one step burn it all together. Now, I know that makes it appear, you know, I mean, we're looking at that, and we're just thinking of him, you know, burning everything up. But at the same time, I think, too, when God met Moses at the burning bush, and that eighth Sinai is a thorn bush. Christ, when he was wearing a crown of thorns, the same bush that God met Moses in, now Christ is in the midst of the bush. Could that be possibly alluding to that? I don't know. That is just a thought. I always look at little things like that and think about it, but I don't know for sure which one is which there. Um, but anyway, all right. So before we continue on, I'm going to add in right after Genesis here. So we're going to pause for one moment. 
Okay, here we are right here, and I think this may be the one I'm looking for. Now, of course, if you look in this video here, besides Ariel Sharon, uh, Ariel Sidak speaking there, you also have this one lady speaking of a alien abduction uh, by a reptilian on the same video there. But let me just play this here. Tradition tells us that the army of the Messiah is not to come from heaven, but is to arise from inner earth and therefore dominate the surface world. Perhaps we are now at this special... And then, of course, they show the reptilian hand. Now, there is a video there that where he also speaks about that as well. Now, Rabbi Leitman uh, believes that the serpent is the helper. He says here, we're not from this world, we're sent to conquer it. Here's another revealing video of Rabbi Michael Leitman, the Jewish Kabbalist, who, whose theory is the Jews are sent from another universe to take form of various human peoples and conquer them through subversion of their world ego. The earlier video I posted was derived from this one uh, that he says there. I'm trying to see if they got the actual video here about that. I don't. Jews are sent from another universe. Let me just see if we have that as a video. Here we go, Rabbi Leighton. Israel, Israel means the spark, the point in the heart that is like an alien force within a hostile land or a hostile country. But I'd like to say this circle is the, the hostile land and this is Israel. Rabbi Zito. There you go. And we, found here, should really try to conquer that ego, to correct it. So first, we have to strengthen ourselves. Strengthen ourselves and also bestow upon that's just letting you know that they believe they're from another another world and everything, but he clearly believed that the serpent was the one that gave light and that that is their king, as Rabbi uh, Sadok also brings out on the History Channel there. Now, let me jump back over here. Let's get back into the PowerPoint here. Uh, we'll start from the slide that we're on. So we've got Revelation 13. We saw the beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. The beast which I saw was likened to a leopard. His feet were as feet were as a bear, and his mouth the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now I saw another one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. As we already brought this out, right? So the whole world is wondering after the beast, even though the deadly wound has been healed. So everybody's looking for a particular individual, but it actually represents Satan's kingdom that is being brought through the Pharisaic line. And this is one reason why we see Chabad Jews so much in control of all the global leaders. It is the Pharisees. The deadly wound is healed. And the whole world is wondering after the beast, forgetting that Jesus already identified who they were. And it says, who is able to make war with him? They worshiped the dragon. They gave power unto the beast. So when you are caught up in the Zionistic beliefs, you're already worshiping the beast and don't even know it. That's how blind people can get. Oops, sorry, too fast. Revelation 17, there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, talked to me, saying unto me, come, Come here, I will show, show you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters. She's called a whore because she was whoring in Babylon. When the leaders of the people of the nation, Ezra chapter 9, clearly identifies, and they mingled their seed with the peoples of the lands, the Hittites, the Perzites, the Jebusites, and the Ammonites. Remember that? 
if you read it in the in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it is even more damning the the information that is there. Verse two: With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit of the wilderness. I saw the woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having he seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colored, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of the abominations of the filthiness of her fornication. And the woman, uh, and and upon her forehead was a, was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Why is it a mystery? Because the deadly wounds healed and everybody forgot that it was the Levites, the priest, and the people that had mingled that seed all the way back in Babylon. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. He couldn't understand why. John couldn't understand it. In other words, the Pharisees put Christ to death. They put the apostles to death. Verse 6, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, right? Okay, that's what happened. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carry it to her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. Don't forget, you know, Leviathan is a seven-headed serpent. Didn't know that? The beast that you saw was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and goes into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Why? Because everybody looks human. Then nobody can figure it out. We got a reptilian race running this country, running this whole world and is mingled into that bloodline of the Pharisees. Here's the mind, verse 9, which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains which which the woman sits. And by the way, <laughs> Jerusalem does sit on seven hills. Think about that, right? So now, many of you are looking at Ezekiel 38 is, oh, this is Russia. No. No. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face towards Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you forth and all your army and horses and horsemen and all of them that are clothed most gorgeously in great company with buckler and shield and all of them handling swords. Persia, Cush, and put with them. All of them with a shield of a helmet. Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togama and the outermost parts of the north and all his bands, even many peoples with you. You know, I did a, a, a message, it's been years ago now, where we actually went into the areas of Gog, the land of Magog. Modern Russia, the country of Russia, is never a part of the land of Magog or Gog or any of it. Turkey, Ukraine, wow, didn't know that, Ukraine? Do you realize every prime minister of Israel, with the exception of Netanyahu and Bennett, all come from Ukraine? Yeah. Eastern Ukraine is part of that land. Oh, you might say, but brother Steve, Persia, that's Iran. Yeah. Israel controls Iran. Israel will use, the elite of Israel will use Iran to attack themselves to fulfill their own prophecy. But Ezekiel 38 is identifying Gog of Magog, the land of Magog, is much greater than just a physical war. It is also a war that is bringing out Leviathan himself, the reptilian king that is over Israel, or over the people that claim to be Israel. Not the innocent Bedouin, 
Not the innocent Palestinian. 50% of the Palestinians are crypto Jews as well. Not them. In fact, if you look at the scripture, we already see, be thou faithful unto death. God knows that they were going to be murdered and massacred. Well, you might argue right now, well, they're also killing the Jews. Well, listen, the people have been oppressed. But let's look at the scripture here. I put a note here. It is clear by the hooks it is, it is Satan. I misspelled some words here. Sorry about that. Leviathan. Let me show you this. Job chapter 40, verse 25. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a ring into his nose or bore his jaw through with a hook? That's how you know what this is. I will turn you about and put hooks into your, into your, into your jaw or into your jaws. That's interesting. Why, why jaws? Why plural? Why Ezekiel saying plural? You remember what Revelation said? He's got seven heads. Now it makes more sense, right? And I will bring you forth and all your army, horses and horsemen. That's going to be interesting too. We're going to get to that horses and horsemen again. Remember, there's another prophecy I just shared with you recently. I told you, this is going to make you think deeply. You're going to have to really go deep on these things, friends. So the one that is draw, the drawn out with a hook in the jaw is Leviathan. So think about that. Now, let's also take a look at Ezekiel 29. No, not 28, not 38, not nothing like that. 29, Ezekiel 29. Verse 3, Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lies in the midst of his rivers, that hath said, My river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. See, Satan was in control of Egypt. And I will put hooks in your jaws. And I will cause the fish of the rivers to stick unto your scales. And I will bring you up out of the midst of the rivers. And all the fish of the rivers shall stick unto your scales. What? Hooks into the jaws? Leviathan laying in the rivers of Egypt? Now there's no doubt it's a metaphoric word, verbiage, but again, hooks in the jaws, Leviathan, a seven-headed beast, serpent. And I will cast you into the wilderness and you and all the fish of, of, you, of your rivers, and you shall fall upon the open field and shall not be brought together nor gathered to the beasts of the earth and the fowls of the heaven have I given uh, you for food. In the and all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord because they have been a staff and a reed of the house of Israel. Think about it, friends. Jeremiah chapter 9. Watch this. This one blows me away, right? I will make Jerusalem heaps a layer, they put jackals, that's wrong, tanin. Tanin is serpents or dragons. And I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without inhabitant. Wow, did he do it? Sure he did. Matthew 23, fill you up the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? There you go right there. Jerusalem becomes a heap of tanin, dragons, serpents. I will make the cities of Judah desolate and without inhabitant. This is later fulfilled in the times of Christ. We know that, right? Right here, Matthew 23, you continue on down. Wherefore, behold, I send to you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify. Some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Bacchaeus, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets and stone them which are sent unto you. How often I have gathered you as a, as a children together, even as a hen gathered chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you. What? Desolate. And what did he say? 
He said Jerusalem becomes a heap of serpents and will make their cities of Judah desolation without inhabitant. Now, Jeremiah is actually speaking of the prophecy of when they go into Babylon. But nonetheless, they come back and they still go back into that because they weren't, at that time, they weren't a heap of dragons as of yet or serpents. It wasn't until they mingled that seed that they mingled it in with the Nephilim, which were reptilians. We read on down verse 12, and the Lord said, say, says, because you have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not hearkened to my voice, neither walked therein, but have walked after the stubborn of his own heart, and after Balaam, which their fathers taught them. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood, and give them water and gall to drink. I will scatter them also among the nations, whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send the sword after them till I have consumed them. And as we've already gone into this, Matthew 23. All right, now, moving on. Let's see. Um, yes, let's go to verse 4 in Ezekiel 38 here. I will turn thee about, put hooks in thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen. All of them clothed gorgeously, great company with buckler, shield, handling swords. We got into the Persia and all of them, right? Shield and helmet. Gomer and all his bands in the house of Tograma, the uttermost parts of the north, and all his bands, even the peoples with it. Now the horsemen and the reptilians is what I want to get into were Joel. Remember, I shared with you about this in Joel's prophecy. Verse 2. A de- Let's first start with verse 1. Blow you the horn in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord comes, for it is at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds, thick darkness as blackness spreads upon the mountains. A great people, a mighty, he- there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after them, even to the years of many generations." Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame blazeth. The land is a garden of Eden before them, behind them a de- desolate wilderness. Yea, nothing escapes them. The appearance of them is the appearance of horses, and as a horseman, so do they run. That army is a reptilian army. No doubt about it. You continue on down, continue on. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of the mountains, do they leap? Like the noise of a flame fire, do they devour the stubble as a mighty people set in a battle array? At their presence, the peoples are in anguish, all faces of gathered blackness. I told you the Gog of Magog war is not what you think it is. Ezekiel 38 also is alluding to the same type of battle. We're going to continue on in Ezekiel 38 to prove this point. At their presence, the peoples are in anguish, right? Okay, so we go on down. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. They move on everyone in his ways, and they entangle not their paths. Neither does one trust another. They march everyone in his highway. They break through the weapons and suffer no harm. They leap upon the city. They run upon the wall. They climb up into the houses. They enter into the windows like a thief. Before them, the earth quakes. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon are become black and the stars withdraw. They're shining. So we continue on, Ezekiel 38. All right? We're going to continue on. Um... Verse 8, after many days thou shalt be mustered for service. The latter years thou shalt come again against the land that is brought back from the sword, that is gathered out of many peoples against the mountains of Israel, which have been a continual waste, but is brought forth out of the peoples, and they dwell safely, all of them. See, the house of Israel has always been there. You're still looking for the lost tribes of Israel to come back. The lost tribes of Israel were gathered when Christ was still here. And you shall ascend. You shall come like a storm. You shall be like a cloud to cover the land and you and all the bands of many peoples with you. That's Gog of Magog. That is, they're coming like a cloud. Flying. 
You know, Daniel speaks of the king of the south working with the king of the north. We'll go into that in a minute. Thus says the Lord God, it shall come to pass in that day that these things shall come into, into your mind and you shall devise any devise an evil device. And you shall say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will come upon them that are quiet, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. That's the Bedouin! You know, this Gog of Magog battle has been moving on, moving on, moving on. It began back in, in, in the 30s, and it's been slowly moving on until finally their little reptilian friends will come to help battle with them in a final showdown. Now, I said in Acts, see, look, what do we have here? And they, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these that speak Galileans? How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Perithians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phyra, Philia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya and Cyrene, and strangers of Rome and Jews and proselytes. Right? They, they, this was, friends, listen. <laughs> that was the house of Israel. And we know that because Paul says it is, says it is in the book of Acts as well. But I want to share something with you here. Right? A lot of you missed something here. Where Acts chapter 2 is fulfilled in Zechariah's 8th prop prophecy. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, Let us go speedily to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. And I will go also. Yea, many peoples, mighty nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem. You just saw the nations gather there, didn't you? Treat the favor of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all the languages of the nations. We just read there. We all speak, they, we all hear them speak in our own language wherein we were born. Shall even take the hold of a skirt of him that is a Jew. Vehiziku bekanaf ish Yahudi. One Jewish man, Jesus Christ. They say, we will go with you for we heard that God is with you. We have heard that God is with you. Acts chapter 2, verse 6. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. How do you guys miss it? I, I don't get it. I, I, I missed it too, so I, I'm right there with you. I'm not trying to point a finger at you. I'm right there with you. Verse 14, Acts chapter 2. But Peter, standing up in the eleven, lifted up his voice, said unto them, You men of Judea and all you that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing as but the third hour of the day. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons, your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And on my servants and my handmaids I will pour out in those days my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above the signs in the earth beneath blood, fire, vapor, and smoke. Not only that. Verse 20. The sun shall be turned into darkness and moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wow. The darkness, the moon turns to blood. Almost sounds like a planet X passing, right? But we get down to verse 36. This is the one that's important that you know that the house of Israel was already there. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. They were already there, friends. They were already there. Jesus said to his apostles, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What did you think? They, they failed in their job? The house of Judah got saved first, yes, but then the house of Israel come in immediately thereafter. Let's get back to Ezekiel so we can look at Daniel's prophecy. After many days, verse 8, shall be mustered for service in the latter years. You shall come against the land that is brought back from the sword, that is gathered out of many peoples against the mountains of Israel, which have been a continual waste, but it is brought forth out of the peoples, and they dwell safely, all of them. They weren't having problems. 
and you shall ascend and you shall come like a storm. You shall be like a cloud to cover the land and you shall and, and you and all your bands and many peoples with you. Thus says the Lord God, it shall come to pass in that day that these things shall come into your mind and you shall, do, shall devise an evil device. And you shall say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages and I will come upon them that are quiet and dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. If you look at Daniel 11, you'll see that prophecy as well. Verse 39, you shall deal with the strongest fortress with the help of a foreign god. Yeah, you remember? Laban and them, they believe the serpent is their god. They believe that reptilian king is their god. Whom he shall acknowledge and shall increase in glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for a price. Yeah, Naphtali Bennett will divide Jerusalem so they can get the third temple. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. It doesn't say at him in Hebrew. It says, Ve'et nageach imo melech anagiv. The king of the Negev desert is going to push Imo with him. I find it interesting they call him the king of the Negev, showing that only Israel, modern state of Israel, could be that, that land. And he's made himself the king of the Negev. He comes against him like a whirlwind with chariots. Comes, king of the north shall come not against him. It doesn't say against him. The king of the south will push with him and the king of the north will come over him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow as he passes through. He shall enter in also into the beauteous land and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall be delivered out of his hand. Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. They're going to take Egypt out next. That's their plan because they need the Sphinx. But he shall have power over the treasuries of gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt. Oh, wow, yes. The International Monetary Fund, the Jewish bankers, they control the entire world. Sure, sure they do. Going back to Ezekiel 38. To take a spoil, to take a prey, to turn the hand against the waste places that are now inhabited and against the people that are gathered out of the nations that have gotten cattle and goods and dwell in the middle, middle, middle of the earth. Sheba Didan, Tarshish, with all the ma magnets thereof, shall say unto you, Comest, Come you to take the spoil? Have you assembled your company to take the prey, or to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to, to take a great spoil? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people Israel dwell safely, shall you not know it? Yeah, they knew it. We see that. That's fulfilled right there with Ben-Gurion and them when they come there and they know that, they're, that these are the real Jewish people. And you shall come from that place out of the uttermost parts of the north, you and many of the peoples with you, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And you shall come against, against my people Israel as a cloud to cover the land. Now, let this one soak in deep for you in Habakkuk. Now you'll know who they really are. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and impetuous nation that marches through the breadth of the earth to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 6 we're at. They are terrible and dreadful. Their law and their majesty proceed from themselves. That's a Talmudic law. That's what Jesus said about them too. He said to them that they make up laws of them own selves. Their horses also are swifter than leopards and are more fierce than wolves of the desert and their horsemen spread themselves. Yea, their horsemen come from far. They fly as a vulture that hasten to devour. Wow, boy, that sounds... Is that NATO? Is that, is that Russia and China now? Is it the reptilians that are going to be coming in? Or is it a combination of all of the above? I think it's a combination of all of the above. They come all of them for violence. Their faces are set eagerly as the east wind and they gather captives as the sand. 
They scoff at kings and princes are derision unto them. They deride every stronghold, for they heap up earth and take it. Then their spirit does pass over the transgress, and they become guilty. Even they who impute their might unto their God. That's something to think about. What God do they really serve? Continuing on down. We'll go to verse 13. You that are of the eyes too pure to behold evil and cannot look on mischief, wherefore look you when they deal treacherously and hold your peace? When the wicked swallowed up the man that is more righteous than he? That's what Habakkuk asked of God. You're holding, you can't look at evil, and yet you're sitting there and watching these people that have come from Europe and that claim this, this elite group that claim to be the true Jews, and they're down there killing the Bedouins and the Palestinians. You make men as the fish of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them. They take up all of them in the angle and catch them. Well, we don't have to read all that there. We'll continue on. As we go back to Ezekiel. Let's see. I don't know why I put that in there. Let me just see. Um, oh yeah, I did that because of the horses. Again, back to verse 4. And I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws. That's Leviathan. And I will bring you forth and with all thine army, horses and horsemen. Can't help but wonder about Revelation 6 then, can we? I saw and behold a white horse, sat on him, had a bow, the crown was given unto, him to con given unto him and went forth conquering and to conquer. When he'd opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given unto him that sat thereon to, make, to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. That's exactly what they do. They have the Gentile war against the Gentile and kill each other. And when he had opened the third so I heard a third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld in law a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. I heard a voice in him in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. He's making money off these wars, isn't he? Making money. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the beast say, Come and see. And look, behold, the pale horse. And his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed him with a power was given unto, him, to them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and hunger with death with the beast of the earth. Now we got the reptilians coming to battle with them as well. When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw the soldiers on the altar slain, the, the slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held. They cried with a loud voice, How long, O Lord, true unto us, thou not judge and avenge our blood? On them that dwell on the earth. Very good point, right? We get to Revelation 6. After, after we get about the, the robes that they're given, I behold, when he had opened the sixth seal, although there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, the moon became as blood, the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll, when it rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, every bondman, every free man, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Friends, it's coming. That judgment day is coming. When we look at Malachi 4, I cannot help but Malachi 4 really is speaking to that as well. For behold, the day cometh that burns as an oven or as a furnace and the proud and all that do work wickedness shall be stubble in that day that shall set them ablaze, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Their root is Satan, Leviathan. Jesus speaks in another place, ye are the branches. If you come from that good tree, which is Christ, but there's also an evil tree and that's where they're from. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in its wings. Could that be alluding to this Nibiru where they actually speak of it as the winged planet? Sishan also claimed that Nibiru is wrapped in a cloud of iron oxide dust. This, he said, gives it, give it, it its winged appearance in the sky 
and was why the symbol was a winged disc. Uh, maybe, I don't know. I don't know, friends. Anyway, I want to thank you for listening. Thank you for being patient with me here. I know it's been very long and I know it's very hard to follow. If God still lays it on your heart to support the work we do, we appreciate it. We appreciate your love and your kindness. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live. God bless you.